information to make the decisions that I am making. Is that on? Okay. Okay. So that's the uh, information processing. So for this, I will talk about rational inattention model. The economist who proposed this model of rational inattention actually got a Nobel Prize back in 2009 or 10 or somewhere around that time. Okay. Not for this work, I think, though. Then we have uh, forgettability. Okay, so we forget, we tend to forget, uh, even though we might store some information in our memory, as time progresses, we forget that information. Okay, and so we define the notion of sequential equilibrium. to deal with the fact that we might forget some of the information that we have stored. Okay. Then fourth is uh, uh, decision making. Under uncertainty. So sequential equilibrium is something that we have already talked about. Uh, now let's move on to the next topic, which is decision making under uncertainty. So uncertainty can be of two types. One is risk and one is ambiguity. <coughs> so let's uh, think about what is the difference between risk and ambiguity. Anyone, can anyone tell me what the difference between risk and ambiguity is? like mathematically or some hunch no okay so let's say let me give you an example let's say i i want to give you a reward uh, and what i tell you is i have a bag in which half the balls are red and half the balls are blue if you pick a red if you and you don't know okay what uh, you can put your hand inside the the bag and you can take out draw a ball and if it is red, I'll give you reward one. If it is blue, I'll give you reward two. Okay? Uh, so in that case, so that's one, one process. The other process, in the other process, I say, here is a bag. I have a, some blue balls and some red balls. If you take out a blue ball, I'll give you reward one. If you take out the red ball, I'll give you reward two. Okay? So what's the difference between these two problems? These two uh, situations. So in one case, I tell you half the balls are red, half the balls are blue. In the other case, I say some balls are red and some balls are blue. Okay. So in one case, you know that the probability of taking out the blue ball is one half, right? Because half the balls are blue, half the balls are red. So that's a situation that can be modeled at a, as a risk, as a risk, because you know what the probability of underlying random variables are. The other situation where I don't tell you how many red balls and blue balls are there. It's a situation with ambiguity because you don't quite know what the probability distribution of the random variables are going to be. Okay? So in risk, you know what the probability distribution is. In ambiguous situation, you don't know what the probability distribution is. And yet, you need to make a decision. Okay? So that's the definition of uncertainty. So as far as the risk is concerned, I will talk about prospect theory. And this will be the majority of the class will be spent on understanding prospect theory. And then the fifth part within this topic would fall, would, would talk about uh, time inconsistency. <coughs> Consistency, which, uh, which is a topic in dynamic decision making. So some kind of bounded rational behavior in dynamic decision making. So that's time inconsistency. We uh, didn't really dwell on, upon this topic, but let's uh, pause in today's class and think about it. So we'll, I'll talk about hyperbolic discounting here. Okay, so three new topics that I'll be teaching, rational inattention, uh, 
prospect theory and hyperbolic discounting. These are the three new topics that I'll introduce in this class. Okay, any question? Okay. So let me first uh, talk about rational inattention. And the setting is as follows. I, X is the state of the world. Uh, y is H of X comma W. W is the noise parameter. It can represent any randomness uh, in our behavior or any, any external randomness uh, in, the, in the process. <coughs> okay, and we want to minimize the expected cost which depends on x and u which is equal to gamma of y and I want to minimize it with respect to gamma right so this is uh, this would be a usual decision problem if we knew what the model of h looks like but now the issue that uh, Christopher Sims, who developed the model for rational inattention, he says uh, that somehow we need to, so we don't quite know what the model of H looks like, so, but somehow I don't want to uh, express Y to have all the information that's available in X, okay? So we want to differentiate X and Y in some manner. So what did he propose? He proposed that I want to minimize over gamma and H such that the mutual information of X and Y is less than or equal to some rate R. Okay, so those of you who might have taken information theory uh, can recognize this, uh, uh, this inequality. It says that the information uh, this is the rate of uh, information flow from the state from the world to my brain, okay? Because Y is stored in my brain, right? So that's the, that's the rate of information from the actual world to my brain. How do you define mutual information? It's summation of X, Y, P, X, Y. Is there a log? Well, no, there is no negative. So you can have log base E P X Y over P X P Y. That's the definition of mutual information. So P is of course a joint probability distribution between X and Y. Okay, so as soon as you design an H you also design a corresponding joint distribution between X and Y. So this mutual information actually depends on H. Okay, so this would be your, so if you want to uh, learn, or not learn, but if you want to uh, somehow model a decision maker with limited information processing capabilities. <coughs> this is one way that has been proposed back in 2003, I think. If I'm not mistaken, it was proposed in 2003 or 2002. Uh, one model where you explicitly enforce some sort of uh, information processing constraint on the decision maker. Okay, so that's the rational inattention model. Again, for games, I haven't seen any paper that studies rational inattention. So something that might be good to think about. Yeah. Uh, you can have any other log base. Oh, 
in information processing you will have log base 2 sorry in information theory correct correct well not words but uh, in in information theory you pass bits and that's passed in uh, 0 1 so that's log base 2 that's usual in information theory and then you call it i mean uh, this would be called in terms of bits per second or something bits per uh, information flow bits per bits transmitted per channel use okay that's how you would call it uh, but i think any other log is equivalent because even if you have log base e okay so you can change the base by a constant factor so that means you are scaling this r according to some constant multiple which is not uh, doesn't matter so anyway yeah yeah What's gamma is your decision rule gamma is your strategy strategy which maps action uh, no information to action okay any other question again it has not been extended to a, well not i shouldn't say it has not been maybe somebody has uh, but i haven't seen any paper that has extended the rational inattention to uh, to game game problems however i have seen papers very recently i think 2016 or 15 no yeah i think 2015 I have seen this model being extended to a Markov decision problem, infinite horizon Markov decision problem. Okay, so there has been some research in a single person decision problem, but in a multi-party setting, I don't know how this, how the solution evolves, how the solution looks like. Something uh, worth thinking about. <coughs> the second short topic is uh, going to be about hyperbolic discounting. Um, which has been uh, somewhat well studied at least in the field of economic psychology and uh, marketing okay so let's see what hyperbolic discounting is Okay, so here is <coughs> the decision problem. Uh, you, I give you this following option. I can pay you a hundred dollars today, or dollar hundred ten tomorrow, or maybe hundred one tomorrow. Okay, this is one option. And your second option is dollar one hundred after a year and dollar one zero one after a year and a day. So you might have to wait for another day after a year to get this hundred one dollar. What would you choose in this setting? The first one? How many of you will choose the first option? <laughs> See, we are talking about bounded rationality. <laughs> Don't forget this bounded thing. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So many people prefer this over this, right? So in some sense, this one maximizes your utility. This one doesn't. Okay. What about this one? How many of you are going to pick this option versus this option? How many of you are going to pick option one? Okay, no one. How many of you are going to pick option two? Many people. Okay, so this this is what many people uh, would pick in the uh, second decision problem. So in some case, this maximizes your utility and this one doesn't. 
right? Uh, so what's going on? You see the problem, the decision problem after a year is the same, okay? It doesn't, it's not very different. If you move forward in time, so I uh, somehow collapse this one year and I ask you to face the same decision problem after a year, right? It will become, it's equivalent to this decision problem in which case you will switch your strategy, right? Uh, so this is known as dynamic inconsistency, so time inconsistency, which means that you will do something today, uh, but if you have to do something after a year, you are going to pick your strategy. Okay, so you're not consistent across time. Your actions are not consistent across time. So this kind of inconsistency is very important in human decision making. So if you ask someone, do you want to eat healthy food? They'll say yes. But if you keep in front of them some pizza or burger or whatever, apple pie, they'll not hesitate to actually eat it, right? And I do it and everyone does it. Okay, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but that's a case of hyperbolic discounting because what they say is, what they think, the, the way they think is, you know, let me eat this pizza today, but from tomorrow onward, I will go on a strict diet, okay? So that's their decision, that's, that's how they think. And that's exactly this phenomena of hyperbolic discounting, okay? So what's going to happen in the future, uh, I will do what is best for myself, but at least for now, I want to maximize some sort of utility that's not going to be consistent. I'm going to express a behavior that's not going to be consistent across time. Okay, so that's hyperbolic discounting. Again, it's well studied for single person decision problem, not as well studied for multi-person decision problem. Okay. So if you want to uh, think of it in terms of uh, a decision problem, this is what a hyperbolic discounting. I might have given this uh, this uh, 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 this way of. Uh, I might have given the expression earlier. So in hyperbolic discounting, you have uh, your you want to minimize u1, u2, all the way up to u capital T, and you want to minimize. Uh, C summation, rather C1 of U1 plus beta multiplied by summation T equals to 2 to capital T, some discount factor, let's say delta raised to T, CT, UT. Okay, and you could have some constraints on this, on this U1 to UT. So this is uh, delta is, so beta is less than one, and then delta is also less than one. <coughs> so all of you must be familiar with just the pure discounting factor, right? Delta raised to T term, okay? MDP with discounted cost and so on. Uh, we are all familiar with that kind of problem. But when you, have, when you have a human decision maker uh, and the person ex exhibits a time inconsistent behavior, then in that case, it has a multiple beta that gets multiplied to the entire future cost. Okay? And at every point of time, he will have the discount factor for the future cost and then he will have a beta term for the entire sum total of the future cost. Okay, so that uh, is... In fact, uh, you can solve this problem by hand for at least two or three time step decision problem with some sort of constraint. C is equal to five. So you have to consume five units of resource. Are you going to consume it now and keep something for the future? Uh, so, so this kind of behavior would be seen. You will not be consistent across time. So one way this behavior would happen is you will think that let's, let me consume 2.5 units of resource now and 1.5 tomorrow and then one the day after tomorrow. And then when tomorrow comes, you will say, you know what, let me just consume the entire 2.5 <coughs> units of resource now and not have anything for tomorrow. 
Okay. So I think, uh, well, I don't know whether that's true or not, but uh, in early days, I think I'm talking about early 1900s, people wouldn't save for retirement. Okay, that was just too far into the future. And so when the retirement time arrives, when they are out of jobs, they pretty much start living on streets because they have nowhere to go. Unless their sons and daughters did exceedingly well, in which case they can live with them. Okay. Uh, so that was a big problem. And part of the reason of starting the social security um, in the United States was exactly this issue that people never save for retirement. Okay. Same, uh, the similar thing it was seen also in the mortgage market. Uh, so now in the US, if you buy a house, you can get a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. Uh, in the early days, you only, in early 1900s, you only had to pay the interest and then you had to pay the full price when the time of the mortgage ends, okay? So you pay like $100 every month, and then after 10 years, suddenly you have to pay $10,000, which is the cost of the house. And nobody actually saved for that end of the time period thing, and that led to many people going out of, uh, I mean, they will start looking for a new house after that, so it was a big, big problem at that time. <coughs> okay. So that was uh, hyperbolic discounting and time inconsistent behavior. So you change your behavior as time progresses. Okay, so you're not consistent across time in your decision making. Um, so that's the fifth topic. Now I want to focus the rest of the class on prospect theory. Okay, any question? No? Okay. So let's, uh, you know, I think this, this, since this is the last class in game theory, let me connect it to the first class in game theory, where we talked about preferences and how it results in utility functions. Okay, so let's talk about uh, simple lotteries. So the topic is Elias paradox. <coughs> I'm going to consider three lotteries, dollar one million with probability 100%, L2, dollar five million with probability 100%, and L3, dollar zero. So I have three simple lotteries. Um, it's obvious that L2 is strictly preferred over L1, which is strictly preferred over L3. Okay, let me uh, come up with a compound lottery, right? So we had uh, discussed how to get compound lottery with simple lotteries. So let's say a compound lottery L1 bar is 0 0.11 L1 plus 0 0.89 L3 and then I have L2 bar which is 0 0.9 L3 plus 0 0.1 L2. Okay, so what does this mean? You get 1 million with probability 0 0.11 and you get zero with probability 0 0.89. And what this says is you get uh, five million with probability 0 0.1 uh, and then zero with probability 0 0.9. How many of you will pick L2 over L1? Okay, so you are willing to trade off this 0.01 percent with at a prospect of getting four million more dollars, right? <laughs> okay, I understand. Uh, so L2 is the preferred preferred uh, action that you might choose if you are faced with such a situation. <coughs> okay. 
let's consider another compound lottery. Okay, so L2, so what everyone is saying is they like L2 bar that's preferred over L1 bar. Fine. Okay. Now let's look at L3 bar, which is L1 bar minus 0 0.89 L3 plus 0 0.89 L1, which means you get 1 million with probability 1. And then I have L4 bar, which is L2 bar minus 0 0.89 L3 plus 0 0.89 L1, which says you get 0 with uh, zero with probability, how much is that? 0 0.01. And then 1 million with probability How much is it? 0 0.09 and 5 million with probability 0. Point. There's something wrong going on here. Zero point nine. Oh, I see. 0 0.1. 1 million with 0 0.89, right? 0 0.89. Uh, okay. How many of you will prefer L4 over L3? So L3 gives you everything with certainty, 1 million with certainty. In L4, there is some risk involved. So you can get zero, 5 million, but you can also get 0 dollars with a small probability. What, so who, who prefers L3 over L4? Okay. So, so many people prefer L3 over L4, right? So you have reversed it, right? L2 was the preferred choice over L1 in this case, okay? But I did the same I have done the same uh, manipulation to both the lotteries, and now people have switched their preferences. Okay? So this is known as a uh, Elias paradox. And as you can see, remember we talked about this uh, uh, four axioms that we all, I mean, you see we all agreed that of course our decision making or our preferences should satisfy those four axioms, right? And this was independence axioms. independence axiom, okay? This was one of the four axioms which said that if I change the lottery in a similar fashion, then there should not be any change in the preferences, okay? But as we see here, that's not the case when <coughs> humans are involved, okay? A rational decision maker wouldn't switch uh, as long as you assume that the rational de decision maker would satisfy an independence axiom a rational decision maker wouldn't switch their preference based on uh, based on uh, the same I mean not based on the same but just by looking at this they won't change their preference because it's the same it's the same manipulation that you have done to the original lottery so that's the that's the problem and how do we explain this kind of situation um, so people, uh, psychologists actually studied this problem through experiments in 1960s and 70s. And so uh, the first topic is rank dependent utility that tells you how exactly people make a decision in these situations. Okay, so each of these should be seen as a decision problem and you have to pick which one 
which lottery is it that you would like to like to take what maximizes your utility so the next topic is rank dependent utility You know, I'm kind of surprised that all of you exhibited the same, well, maybe not surprised, all of you exhibited the same decision making that is actually uh, proved in laboratory that most people actually take the same decision. So maybe it's not surprising, or maybe it is surprising, okay, given that you have gone through so much of education and taken so many math courses and whatnot, and yet you exhibit the same behavior that anyone walking on the street actually uh, has the same behavior or similar behavior. Okay, anyways. Uh, so here is how you define rank dependent utility. So first of all, you have x1 greater than equal to x2 greater than equal to xn. So these are dollar amounts. Okay, so 1 million, 2 million, 5 million, 0 dollars, whatever. And then you have utilities, u of x1 and u of xn. Okay, naturally you assume that the higher the value of x is, the higher the utility is going to be. Uh, and let's say the probability of uh, having x1 is p1, and then the probability of uh, x2 occurring is p2 and pn. Okay, so that's the probability vector. So this would lie in a simplex of a dimension n. So the expected utility is summation of Pn u of xn. n equals 1 to capital N. OK. This is the expected utility. And this is what von Neumann suggested. <coughs> that uh, humans, von Neumann wa suggested in his book, 19, in his 1944 book, uh, which was the first book on game theory, he suggested that humans minimize or, oh, humans maximize expected utility, which is given by this particular expression. And let me rewrite this. Uh, this utility in this fashion. Okay. So I sum all the way from i equals one to n, sum of pi minus i equals sum of i equals 1 to n minus 1 of pi. Okay, it's the same expression. That's expected utility. Okay, now based on experiments, psychological experiments by various psychologists and uh, after some analysis, people said <coughs> that humans make decision according to this particular fashion. So they somehow distort this, this difference uh, in certain manner. Okay, and let's, let's see what that is. So that's rank dependent utility of x is going to be summation of n equals 1 to capital N w of summation so w is some function
And what does W look like for most people? W of pi, and this is pi. This is the identity curve. Uh, the identity curve leads to expected utility. And most people, this is kind of normal. This will be 1, and this will be 1. Okay, so this is this is normal. And the expression is given by, and I'm, uh, this, this research comes from 1980, somewhere in 1980s, 1982. W of pi equals pi raised to c over and c is 0 0.61. Okay, so what do you do? Uh, how do you make decision? Well, you are given different values of different choices x's. Okay, so each x, of course, when I write x, I also implicitly well. Let me write it as the x comma p. Okay, because p is also very much part of uh, <coughs> x, and so. So you might be given different uh, vectors x and different vectors p, okay, just like I did in the previous examples. And then all of you try to maximize your rank dependent utility, okay, for various x's and various p's. You picked a picked an option, picked an x comma p pair that maximized your rank dependent utility. And since all of you behaved normally your curve of w actually looks something like this okay so this is like the curve for a normal person and for a pessimist it would look something like this okay this is a pessimist curve so if someone says you know i am a pessimist you know exactly what their w looks like okay um so what is actually uh, this person doing? So let's look at a normal person. What is it doing? So remember, x1 is, has the highest reward, right? Yeah, x1 has the highest reward. Uh, so this is w of p1. So w of p1 is greater than 1, OK? So what this person is trying to do uh, is, let's say this is my P1, W of P1, and this is P1. Okay, and this would be your P1, actual P1, because it's, it's the identity curve. So this person actually magnified the probability of the maximum reward okay in his favor so that's what I, so this is exactly what i was telling you when i when i talked about how a gambler would go ahead in the gambling and and pay put so much money into gambling because they always magnify the probability of winning a jackpot okay <coughs> Same thing happens for low reward events. Okay, so if xn is close to zero or negative, they would magnify the effect. Okay, they would magnify the effect of low probability events as well. So, uh, well, no, they won't magnify it, but 
they will say that the low probability event, so I will never get struck by a lightning or I will never get struck by, I don't know, accident or something of that sort. Okay, so something that is bad for me, I'll just say that, you know, it's not going to happen to me, it happens to other people. Okay, something like that. So that kind of behavior is exhibited by many individuals. But it turned out that this also had problems, okay? This kind of model had some issues uh, when more experiments were conducted in the entire era of from 1980 to 1990s, early 1990s. And so they came up with uh, prospect theory, uh, which is uh, one step ahead of RDU, rank dependent utility. Um, so one thing that is not captured by this particular, uh, this particular expression is, uh, you know, you could have some events that are uh, profits and some events that are losses. Okay, so it just doesn't treat profits and losses separately. It treats profit and losses in the same, in the same particular manner, uh, which turns out that people don't really uh, consider it on the same with the same weight. To give you an example, let's say you were walking from uh, your house after this class and you lost $10 on the way, okay? You will feel some amount of sadness, okay, that I lost $10. It turns out for most people that, uh, okay, so this is one scenario. The second scenario is you were walking down to your home and you found $10 lying on the street and you will feel some sort of happiness, elatedness that you found $10 on the road. It turns out for most people that the, the sadness out of losing $10 is far more than the happiness coming from getting the $10 lying on the road. Okay, so somehow when you see a loss, you exaggerate the effect of loss on your well-being, right? And when you see a profit, an unexpected profit, then you, then the happiness is not as much, okay, in comparison to the loss. So that is not captured by this rank dependent utility. So in 1992 or three, uh, they came up with a more modified formulation that takes into account the loss aversion of uh, human decision making. Okay, so prospect theory, which is equal to rank dependent utility plus loss aversion. So you have a W plus for profit, you have W minus for loss and you have signed ranking which means x1 is greater than or equal to Okay, and so your prospect theory of x comma p will be given by, well, I shouldn't write pt, it's something like prospect utility. Let me just write it as prospect utility or ptu. So ptu at x comma p is given by summation i equals 1 to k w plus pi or pn or well i plus p1 minus w plus <coughs> pi minus 1 plus p1 multiplied by u of xi 
plus summation j equals k plus 1 to capital N U of XJ. Okay. So, when you are faced with multiple x's and p's, okay, xp pairs, you will pick the xp pair as your decision based on the one that maximizes your prospect theory utility. Okay, so, this considers the loss aversion aspect as well as the rank dependent utility aspect of our decision making. Okay, that is how our brain decides um, to to do something because that maximizes the the total prospects of our choices uh, empirically again w plus of pi and w minus of pi has the same formula uh, and u of alpha is equal to alpha raised to theta, alpha greater than 0, 0, alpha equal to 0, and minus lambda minus alpha raised to theta prime alpha less than 0. Okay, And the parameters are c equals 0 0.61, d equals 0 0.69, theta equals theta prime equals 0 0.88, and lambda equals 2.25. And this, these values actually come from Kahneman and Tversky. Okay, and Kahneman received the Nobel Prize for proposing this particular theory. Uh, in fact, uh, Tversky would have got it, but he, he unfortunately passed away, uh, I think in late 1990s, uh, because of which he couldn't, he was ineligible for receiving a Nobel Prize posthumously. Okay, so so it has really this this idea has really revolutionized the field of mathematical psychology and now engineers who are designing systems for a human um, for systems that interact directly with human beings uh, they are they have started looking into these models because they become extremely important when you have human beings right in front of you okay when you are designing models for human beings so if you are designing something designing an algorithm for uber or for amazon web services or uh, what else uh, airbnb uh, then you have to take into account the fact that human decision maker uh, behaves in a very different manner than what we actually the way we do mathematics okay it's very different from that they don't minimize the expected utility uh, so, if w plus and w minus was identity, then they are essentially expected, then this is exactly equal to the expected utility. So, w plus w minus equals to identity implies 
PTU is same as expected utility. Uh, but of course, humans don't, I mean, this is not identity. This is given by this particular expression. I mean, not given by, but it has been estimated. For most human beings, it's what, that's what it looks like. The numbers look like. And so we should, we should take into account this fact and then design the system accordingly. Okay. Um, so to give you an idea, let's say my theta and theta prime was equal to 1. If I lose $10, my sadness level is the same as gaining $22.5 on the road. Okay, so I found an envelope with $22.5. I feel the same happiness as, I, as the amount of sadness I feel by losing $10 on the road. Okay, so there is some sort of scaling uh, of, uh, of the amount of sadness I should have for losing ten dollars uh, while going back home, okay. Uh, any any question on this uh, particular topic? No, it's I think it's fairly self-explanatory. It's uh, it's an essence of years of research by uh, many psychologists, especially Kahneman and Tversky. They carried out several experiments and tried to fit the data. I mean, imagine if you were, if you were living in 1960s, where everyone minimizes, expect, minimizes or maximizes expected utility, and you know that there is something wrong with that idea, okay? You know that something wrong with the notion. But how do you prove to the world that, you know, what you are doing is wrong, and here is another function that humans are actually maximizing or minimizing, okay? So if you are faced with that issue, you have to design very careful experiments uh, and then figure out what this, what this number looks like, what this value looks like. And really took, uh, I think, 20 plus years of research to get to that particular formula, what you see on the board, okay, this particular formula. Now, you know, my, my main, uh, I mean, one of my, uh, primary love is uh, probability theory, okay? I really love probability theory. And somehow, and so I want to give you some, so those of you who might have taken theory of probability or measure theory, uh, I want to give you some food for thought, okay? It's, it's not something easy, but I still want to cover that in the class because it's important. So, So you can write for a expected utility of x comma p can also be written as u of x multiplied by p dx, okay, where x ranges from let's say minus infinity to infinity, okay. And this p actually satisfies satisfies a all the axioms for being a measure, okay? So satisfies uh, all properties of a measure. On the other hand, and this is the usual Lebesgue integral. On the other hand, if you look at prospect theory, this is So this is Chokwe integral, so u of x nu plus or rather, yeah, some way of uh, p plus of dx plus integral minus infinity to zero u of x p minus dx. And these are not, these are not measures, these are what is known as capacity. Okay, and these integrals are Chokwe integral.
okay? So if you want to study prospect theory from a purely mathematical angle, you know, you have to go completely out of your comfort zone. There is a course in theory of probability and measure theory and whatnot. There is no course on Chokwe integral and capacities. And what should the, uh, what is a natural topology on the space of capacities and so on. Okay, so that's a real issue uh, for studying uh, prospect theory from a purely mathematical viewpoint. Uh, I'm sure some people might be doing it, but uh, it's very hard in, because there is not much literature on, uh, on those kind of uh, integrals and capacity to do some interesting work. So for instance, even uh, proving the existence of Nash equilibrium when the two players have prospect theoretic uh, way of making a decision, you can't really do it because there is no weak star topology on the space of capacities. I mean, it's not, there's no literature on that particular subject. Um, so you can't study it. So it's really a big, uh, big pain to study uh, this kind of uh, problem in a game theoretic setting because remember in game theory, every equilibrium, if you have to prove the existence of equilibrium, you have to use a fixed point theorem which has been developed for a very nice looking spaces. Um, so, so yeah, we will see how this uh, thing evolves. So that's uh, uh, some sort of mathematical detour into looking at prospect theory from a, uh, from a purely mathematical viewpoint. Now the other thing that I want to uh, let you know, some food for thought, is that remember that expected utility was actually uh, proposed by um, it was proposed by uh, von Neumann as a way people behave, right? And it had, a, it had an axiomatic foundation. So there are a set of axioms. If your preferences satisfy those axioms, then there exists a utility function, and then there exists a probability distribution that gives you how you should behave, that gives you a way to make a decision. Uh, it turns out that prospect theory also has an axiomatic foundation, okay? So there are some set of seven or eight axioms that if your preferences satisfy those axioms, then you actually behave according to, according to this uh, uh, sort of way of computing the utility function. So naturally, some of those axioms that von Neumann had suggested had to be thrown away and new axioms had to be brought in to explain this kind of behavior. Uh, but I'm not going to cover that because that's also a fairly involved uh, topic. Uh, but it was proved in 1987. So that gives you an axiomatic foundation for prospect theory. Okay. Okay, so think about it. What would you do? If I hire you as a graduate student and I tell you that I'll pay you $2,000 per month or I'll pay you $4,000 with probability half, which one are you going to choose? <laughs> okay, so, right, so, uh, so that's, the, uh, that's the issue. If you were all expected utility uh, maximizers, then you are indifferent to both these options. Okay, so if I send you one contract and the other contract, you should be indifferent. You can sign any one of them. But nobody is, okay? Everybody wants that $2,000 with certainty at the end of the month. Okay, so this, this exactly explains your behavior without making any assumption, okay? All right, so that ends this class on game theory. I hope you enjoyed this class. I absolutely enjoyed teaching it because it's my favorite subject, but uh, hopefully some of the things that we have studied will be of some use to your research and many of the topics that we studied should actually give you food for thought for things that you plan to do in the future including after you graduate okay so it's not purely an academic discipline it's also something that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis okay so thank you guys